There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night roam free and things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Well, good evening and welcome to another edition of Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, sitting across the board from me, as always, and looking lovely, Mr. Tim Dennis. Good evening, Tim. Hey, hey. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Doing good. Boy, there's been a lot of crazy stuff going on out in the paranormal world. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, again, we've got the fantastic series uh, Paranormal States back on the air. I hope you guys are checking that out with our good friends Ryan Buell and Sergi and uh, Katrina. Katrina. And Heather (laughs) and the lovely Elfie. They're all out there. (laughs) So hopefully you guys are checking out that show and uh, keeping in touch. Uh, It's a great series. Been a lot of fun watching that come back. Our good friend Chad Kalick was on... uh, the, the premiere episode from American Ghost Hunter, and it mm-hmm. looks like he's just looks like he's going to be doing another uh, episode. Mm-hmm. A bunch of our friends are doing episodes. I'm not at liberty to say who, but there's going to be a lot of familiar faces to the Darkness Radio crowd there uh, so that'll be appearing. This it's year. Good that Gumby and Pokey are getting their uh, fi- you know final due in the That's paranormal right. world. Well, yeah. I know. I think we can say this because they've mentioned it on their website. Our good friends <clears throat> Michael and Marty Perry. <gasps> you can't say that. I can't. It's no. too late. I said it. Yeah. But Michael and Marty Perry are uh, on an upcoming episode as well. Oh, isn't that happy music? And um, yeah, uh, Michael and Marty Perry are going to be on an upcoming episode of the show. Uh, and we've got, like I said, there's just some other really cool stuff going on. So what was some of the news you've heard going on in the paranormal field here, Mr. Dennis? I'm not at liberty to say I'm, <clears throat> I'm under contract. Really? No, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> I you got know. nothing? I got nothing. You got nothing? Yeah. How about in the world of uh, UFOs and Mars rovers and everything? Have you been following up on that as well? Uh, no, I've been more into oil prices lately. Yeah. Why? Record profits, my friend. Record profits. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get that, me an oil company. Yeah, you and me both, sister. <laughs> um, so, as we promised last week, we have a huge announcement to make. <gasps> yes, we do. And we're still not ready to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me, we want to make it. We're just, it's still something that we're... On the fence about? On the fence about. Okay. Maybe that's a good way to put it. Um, So... With that, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time milling it over. I know you guys are going to be all pissed, and Chad Kalick's going to get mad because we're stealing his thing about saying how we're going to break big news and then making you wait another week. But we're we're going to make it. This is a big decision for Tim and I, so we're we're going to make you guys sweat it with us for another <laughs> week here, and uh, we'll make a, an announcement as soon as we can. I do want to make um, a quick mention here. You know, on June eighth, Tim. We had a really interesting and a, a kind of a different show. We had uh, two gentlemen with us, Norman Ober and Nick Roy. Mm-hmm. They were two elderly gentlemen that came on to talk to us. Mr. Ober, an 89-year-old man, was sharing his story. His book was called Anita's Heaven, and it was about his keeping in touch with his dead wife. Mm-hmm. And, and remember the bond that they made together and that she would wait for him. And it was just a beautiful story. Very... Uh, um, I don't know, very heart-touching, would you say? Mm-hmm, absolutely, yeah. Heartwarming, I guess. Uh, and, you know, just it was such a delight to do that show, and it was something a little different. But uh, we, we got news um, on August 1st. We got an email, and uh, Norman Ober died on, uh, on the 1st, I guess, at 7.55 in the morning after heart surgery. Uh, it was a very long surgery. His body wasn't able to handle the seven and a half hours of surgery, mm. plus going into surgery again three hours later as his heart had stopped. Um, but, you know, the the whole juxtaposed of, the, of his story is the fact that he and Anita were meant to be together, and mm-hmm. she's been waiting for him. And if you remember the story, I mean, it was, it was like I said, very heart-touching. He, uh, his wife, who he'd been married to, passed away, and for 18 years... He kept that fire going, and their, their deal was she would not move on out of heaven or onto the next plane without him, mm-hmm. and now he's there. So I guess we can all take a little 
comfort in knowing that Norman and Anita are back together. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's that's a good story to come full circle. Mm-hmm. And it was a real pleasure for us to have him on the show. And for people that missed the show, go back into our archives on June 8th and listen to Hour One with Norman Ober. He was a, a, just a great guy um, and had a great story to share. So uh, we'll just take a quick second here. We're going to do a moment of silence for Norman Ober. All right, and we're back. Thank you very much, and thank you all for tuning in and being a part of that show. We got a lot of really great emails about Norman and, and also about Nick Roy, who <laughs> was also on our show. I think he's 86 years old. Thankfully, Nick is still with us. Mm-hmm. So um, There is no such thing as a darkness radio curse. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there, there is no darkness radio curse. But Norman Ober, uh, we wish you well, sir, and I hope that you and Anita are happy. And we're willing to take emails from you, Norman. I know that's how you and Anita are keeping in touch. Mm-hmm. Feel free to reach out and email one of us and let us know that everything's good and that you and Anita are back together again. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I guess there is going to be um, a memorial uh, that will be held in September as well. And when they release the information to us, we will let people know about that if they're interested. Um, you know, they can be a part of that memorial or send on cards or flowers or something. They can do that. Now we're going to get into tonight's show. Da, 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 da. We're into tonight's show, Tim. And tonight, our guest for the first hour we have with us is the lovely Dusty Smith. And Dusty has been featured on the Discovery Channel show A Haunting in Florida. Um, she's also uh, written quite a few books. Um, she's got a, a new book out. Uh, the, I, gosh, I'm trying to look at it. It's uh, Haunted Daytona Beach, a ghostly tour of the world's most famous beach and Haunted Deland and the Ghosts of West Volusia County. And I'm sure I'm butchering some of these names. But let's welcome to the darkness on the edge of town, Dusty Smith. Good evening, Dusty. Hi, Dave. Hi, Tim. How are you guys? We're doing great. Thank you very much, and thanks for spending some time with us here this evening. Not a problem. Honored to be here. Well, you know, we've been trying to get together with you for, what, about a year now? And it's just, yeah, about that. It, there's always <laughs> something coming around, and one of us is missing the other, so I'm glad we were able to, to get together. And actually, I'm glad it kind of we waited. We got to see and bump into each other again out at TAPSCon, um, which was just a couple weeks back, and we got to see each other out at Ghost Stock. And something I wanted to talk about, uh, Ghost Stock, of course, is run by our good friend Patrick Burns from Haunting Evidence fame. And uh, while I was doing my talk, I was talking about thinking outside the box and trying new technology and new things to try to ghost hunt with. And, you know, people have used the Scrabble tiles and people have used different toys to try to get in. We were joking around about the Magic 8 Ball. But one of the things I had brought up in my talk was the fact that I've, I would be interested in seeing what happens with an Etch-A-Sketch since it's magnetic powder that seems to be working on there, and since ghosts seem to be in a magnetic field, would that would that have some kind of effect? So I'm just curious. Now, you said that you actually put this to work for you. Is that correct? Yeah, we sure did. And, you know, what's funny is you know how it goes when, when you go to these conferences and, right. and conventions and things. You know, you're so busy doing so much that it's really hard to find time to actually sit in on, you know, your friends' lectures and people that you want to hear their lectures and things. And I walked in, like, five minutes before you said the the bit about the Etch-A-Sketch, and I was like, boom, got hit in the head with a two-by-four. And I said, you know, we've used so many other, like, kids' toys with little lights and things like that to try to communicate. Why not the Etch-A-Sketch? So when I got home from, from Go Stock 6, I went and bought several different things. We mm-hmm. actually bought um, <clears throat> two different brands of Etch-A-Sketch type um, toys, and then we bought what's called Fuzzy Faces. Oh, right, That's the little face. little guy with the magnetic chips for yeah, fit, and you could make beards the, and mustaches. Right, right. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, and I was really excited the first case we went to to use these and see you know, what would happen. Right. Turns out that a gentleman committed suicide in the home, and he was being pretty active and not in a real good way. Um, He'd been, you know, throwing uh, different items around and um, scaring their their son and things. Um, And we did about a two-hour-long EVP session in the room where he committed suicide. And the last question I asked, was, why did you commit suicide? You know, and we had audio recorders and videotape and everything else running. And I said, look, I'm exhausted. I need a break. So we went out, took a break. No one was in the house. We come back in, 
And not only was there a name written on the Etch-A-Sketch, there was a the little fuzzy-faced guy had a mustache and a little goatee. And I thought, oh, my God, this is like crazy, you know? <laughs> So I talked now, how to clearly client. was it written? I mean, I'm just curious with, um, with this. It was, <clears throat> when I first looked at it, I thought it said Gulch um, because it, it was not real, real clear. And we were under the assumption that, that the gentleman in the house's name was different than the name that was written. Um, we thought his name was Harry, and it turns out that his nickname was Butch. And when the, the client said, oh, no, it says Butch, I looked at it again, and I said, oh, my God, you're right, you know. And, of course, I went through the whole thing. I made everybody on the team, the client, everybody that was present, write Butch to make sure that we didn't have similar handwriting, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it was, it was absolutely phenomenal. Well, that's um, awesome. Now, did you say that it, it even went as far as to uh, draw little designs on the face for you as well? Yes. Yes. And did it make it look like the guy that killed him, or was it just uh, um, just yes, random that ma- was made the faces? the other thing is Weird. this Butch had one of those little teeny tiny mustaches and mm-hmm. a little, um, you know, the little shot of hair on the bottom lip, that, you know, the kind of goatee. Oh, the Chris thing. Fleming soul patch. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, okay. and <laughs> that's exactly what was on the little fuzzy face, you know. And, you know me, I still was like, okay, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I was still not buying it. And when we were packing up, I was actually talking about the fact that, you know, I couldn't wait to see the video to see, you know, if somebody came in the room while we were outside, you know, if you know, I, I wanted to see. I wanted to make sure that there was no screw-ups anywhere. And as soon as I said it, this ceramic bowl flew off of this shelving unit on the wall in the dining room and almost hit one of my researchers in the head. Wow. And I went, okay. So that was a kind of interesting benefit as well. Um, then we tried it on another case. We've actually used it on three cases so far. The second one we tried it on, um, we had brought a sensitive with us and she supposedly made contact with a Native American girl uh, about six years old. And what was really interesting was we weren't getting words. We were getting images, pictures. Um, We got a snake. um, We got some sort of symbol. um, We got a little smiley face-like thing. um, And then there was this ceramic owl that the client had said, um, the spirit liked to move around the house quite a bit. And sure enough, when we were there, it moved several times. So that was another kind of interesting one. Well, look, um, and think but, Parker Brothers thought they had the uh, market cornered with the Ouija board, huh? Yeah, no. <laughs> Heck with that. Um, you know, we, we've been using the, the Etch-A-Sketch thing, and it's, it's working great. You know, and I'm all, all for trying you know, new things, and I'm sure, you know, the scientific community is really going to raise eyebrows over this L- one. Let me ask Tim this. Tim, do you know, do they make, because we're talking about the Etch-A-Sketch and the magnetic powder in it and the fact that ghosts seem to be able to manipulate magnetic fields, just just scientifically, hypothetically here, Tim, is there a place, do you know, of, can you buy magnetic filings, my, magnetic uh, uh, dust, if you will? Do you know of anything like that? Heck, you can make it. Really? What do you do it on? You just uh, file down any type of metal uh, and then uh, rub magnets over it. And that'll just magnetize them? That should make it magnetized, sure. Because <clears throat> I'm wondering, Dusty, too, what if we opened up... Or file down a magnet. Yeah, file down a magnet. <laughs> what if we opened up a um, magna doodle or a, uh, a natcha sketch poured the powder on the floor around like a ball or something, and then left the room to see if the powder gets disturbed? Because again, if the magnetic field is able to manipulate that, it should it should sway that dust as well, shouldn't it? Well, see, now that's another one that we've done before. Oh, really? Okay. Um, we've used we haven't used the magnetic um, dust, but we've used um, regular baking flour and baby powder. Um, they're the one that comes to mind 
Um, right, right. And I've heard that. that before with the baking powder and that, that yeah, talcum powder and, it and works stuff. Yeah, great. You but know, you but lay out magnetically, a big I wonder if garbage bag, sprinkle it with the powder or the flour, and sure. the one case we actually did get footprints through our flour. You know, so that was kind of interesting. Is that footprint footprints in your flour? Is that anything like tiptoe through the tulips or what? Something like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder what the magnetic filings though. If the magnetic powder would be easier for them to manipulate. I don't know. I'm just something to consider. I, you know, maybe we'll yeah, try exactly. that as breaking one open and, and seeing. Because I'm all for experimenting in the field and getting involved with trying to find new ways to make communication and, and uh, get these barriers broken down. What do you find when you're out investigating is your best tool? What do you seem to get the most response from? Hmm, that's a toughie. Um, you know, I, I'm so old school that I like using, you know, string with bells and the flower and, you know, the, the magna doodle thing is, is an awesome um, addition. Um, I think, though, the, the audio recorders have to be the number one um, thing because, you know, you can't manipulate them. Um, but because EVPs come in on such a lower megahertz, it's really hard to recreate an EVP. Mm -hmm. You know, with digital technology and cameras, it's so easy to recreate stuff now, um, you know, that we don't ever accept um, stuff from clients as, you know, as as true evidence. You know, we've got to figure it out. You know what I mean? Um, So I don't know. There's there's so many things in our arsenal. I mean, dowsing rods are, are a huge thing that we use um we've got several different um types of metal and and sizes of dowsing rods um geez i don't know that's a tough question dave Um, well now dowsing rods see that's something that's still that that's you know that's the piece of of equipment i still have the hardest time with really because i think that of anything that you could hold or anything you could use you know, I understand that there's theories that we may be imprinting ourselves on EVPs, mm-hmm. and we might be imprinting our own thoughts or our own responses. Right. Hence why a lot of EVPs sound like the exact same voice. Right, right. right. Wherever you go, you seem to get the same kind of EVP and the same kind of voice. Um, and we get the same kind of responses in some photography and things like that. My problem with dowsing rods is that even the slightest bits of kinetic energy from your body can make things happen. So I just wonder if we're influencing dowsing rods more than they're being influenced by an outside source. Well, I think we can kind of say that with a lot of the equipment that we use, like you just said. I mean, even an EMF meter, you know, we can pretty much set off ourselves, um, you know, with with EVP. <laughs> One of the ones that we got years ago, this is absolutely my favorite. Um, we were working in a house um, that was converted into a business, and nobody knew the history of the, the place except for me. And I had one of my younger researchers sitting in the stairwell where I knew um, a young girl from Great Britain had fallen down the stairwell, broken her neck, and died. And when she asked, did you die in this house? The EVP that we got back mm-hmm. said, I'm not dead in this great British accent, little hmm. girl's voice. I mean, it was, it was awesome. It was the most awesome thing I'd ever heard, you know, and that's when I kind of went, wow, EVPs are really cool. Oh yeah. EVP you know? is my favorite form of uh, ghost hunting. Cause I just like the immediate results that we can get with it. And you know, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and doing that. And then, you know, we work with friends like Mark and Debbie Constantino who are amazing at getting EVP. Yeah. Oh gosh. He was great. I, I got to meet him at TAPCON, which was a phenomenal event. Um, you know, at the, the hotel, everything, the hotel, the staff, the people that were there, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and one of the things that impressed me the most about it was um, all the volunteers, you know, I'm not a big name, you know, I'm, I'm locally famous, I walk in Walmart and people go, oh, you're the ghost lady, <laughs> you know, but when I, was, when I was over there, the staff treated me like I was you know, a Jason Hawes or a Grant Wilson or, you know, there were no, there were no lines between it. Everybody was on an even playing field. 
And that was really nice. I mean, they stopped by frequently, asked if, you know, I needed anything to drink or... Wow, you know, who do you have to like know that. to get that kind of attention? I, I was fighting just to be able to walk in a room. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, I gave you a stress <laughs> ball, man. No, you did. I thank you for that. And I had to use it quite often. Uh, no, that's hilarious. Yeah, and actually, one of the, the gals there, Summer, who was... Uh, uh, assigned to helping out and, and doing quite a bit, man. She was great. She, I got re-addicted to YooHoo out at TapsCon because of her. Damn it! Oh no! <laughs> yeah, she brought me some great YooHoo, so I've been uh, now I've been craving it since uh, I went out to uh, TapsCon. I know Tim TapsCon YooHoo. Who would have thought the two would go together? She brought yeah, you some great you YooHoo. Great, you know you're sick. <laughs> YooHoo with the can of chocolate milk. Well, we have to take our first break here, Dusty. Uh, thank you for being with us, and everybody stick with We're going to talk to Dusty a little bit more about the ghosts out in her area and her expertise with ghost hunting. We'll be back with more right after this. We thought El Chupacabra meant the cup of coffee in Spanish. Mi amo Eduardo Especial. Como esta el yay? What you talking about, Willis? Shows you what we know. Stay tuned. There's more to come from the darkness on the edge of town. The smell of voodoo hangs in the air. Either that or Dave and Tim had the seven bean salad for dinner. <laughs> Don't nobody go in the bathroom for about 35, 45 minutes. Somebody open the window. Welcome back to the darkness, or whatever is hanging in the air, on the edge of town. And welcome back to the show. You're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. You guys are going to want to stay tuned for hour two. Because we're going to be talking, can you believe it, Tim? I've changed some of my thoughts on orbs. I love a lovely pun- bunch of orbs. Yes. A I've lovely changed, pair. I, I th- there's some stuff that uh, I'm willing to revisit on the idea of what an orb may be. It may not just always be dust or bugs. Yes, it can be reproduced. But we'll talk about that more in the second hour with our very special guest. So stay tuned for that. Yes, Timothy? And if you have a lovely bunch of orbs out there and you want me to revisit it, it's Tim oh, at darknessradio.com. Shoot me an email. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I think I just may shoot you. We're going to go back to tonight's show right now. For the first hour, we're here with Dusty Smith. Dusty, help me out. Tim wants to see orbs. Can you help the guy here? See orbs? Yeah. Well, I'll give you my opinion on them. Yes, and let me hear what your opinion is. This is something we've gone by for a very long time. You know, here in Florida... We get a lot of high humidity, so a lot mm-hmm. of the orbs that we catch, especially at night outside, of course, are humidity. Right. But basic physics dictates energy doesn't die, it only changes form. What are human beings made of? Bunch of minerals, energy, and water. I thought it was okay. snips, snails, and puppy dog tails. Okay. okay. So <laughs> if energy doesn't die and only changes form, the easiest form for energy to take is a sphere or a ball. There is a very small percentage of what's being photographed as orbs that are once living human or animal spirit in nature. And the way that we say the difference is, is that they have to either emit light, cast shadow, show movement, and or be three-dimensional in shape. We'd like to have all four of those qualities, um, but if you look at our website, there's actually um, one photo of an orb on there. Um, it's called Spirit of a Dog. And we took the photo near the grave of a once very famous Daytona Beach area dog. Um, he was actually the Goodwill Ambassador for the area for many years. And, you know, I know when you <laughs> see some of these shows where they go, look, there's a smiley face in the orb. Right. You know, I go, oh, my God, it's just a piece of dust, you idiot, you know. <laughs> Either that or you're but, being haunted by a 1970s button. I always yeah, tell people. exactly. <laughs> it's the guy from Forrest Gump that made those T-shirts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but um, this particular orb, we actually found a photo of the dog and compared the face in the orb to the original newspaper photograph and everyone that looks at it goes oh my god it's him i there's you know and at that point was when i said you know and i've been doing this for almost five years at that point that's when i said wait a minute maybe there is a little something to this orb stuff right um so that's when we kind of came up with a bunch of guidelines and said you know look we're not going to say, how are you supposed to be an open-minded, hello, skeptic, 
if you say that all orbs are dust, pollen, whatever, okay, right. you have to give a little bit of leeway there and say, okay, there is a possibility that this is, it could be something in par- paranormal in nature, or at least a small percentage of them. You know, I, I just, I cannot close my mind to, and say, all orbs are, are dust. I, I can't do it. Not after seeing that photograph and not after studying physics for a long time. Yeah, and that's what I, like I said, I don't want to give too much away because I really want to delve into this for the second hour. But yeah, I had I had kind of a, a reshaping of thought. And I will admit, you know, I'm an open-minded skeptic. I believe in most things. But then there are some things that I've, you know, like fairies and tro- trolls and stuff. I just can't wrap my head around. Have you ever had any experiences with stuff like that? Well, one thing, if I hope you don't mind me bringing this up. <laughs> Go for it. My, my cemetery group, you know me. Um, I don't know if all your listeners know about our cemetery group, and you know. No, go ahead um, and actually start with that real quick. Just explain what you do with your cemetery group, and, okay. and that way, and then people can know how to help you and reach out for that as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm the president of the International Association of Cemetery Preservationists, and what we do is we adopt, restore, and preserve abandoned and neglected historic cemeteries. Mm-hmm. And every year we hold an annual fundraiser where wonderful people like you, Dave, and Patrick Burns, and um, Jason Hawes, Grant Wilson, Troy Taylor, Keith Age, and you name the people, we've got them donating stuff, whether it's a signature on an 8x10 or, you know, whatever. Um, and then we sell raffle tickets and use that money um, straight you know, go straight to our cemetery preservation project. Um, and anybody that would like to see what we have so far um, or would like to buy raffle tickets can go to our website, which is www.iacpinc.org. Why don't and you give that website again a little slower here? I'm sorry? Go ahead and give that website again just a little slower. Oh, okay. It's www.iacpinc.org. C-P-I-N-C.org. Okay, great. And we'll put that up on our website, too, so people can uh, link to it as I well. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And I really do. I have to thank everyone in the paranormal community from Eric Altman sent us some plaster casts of Bigfoot footprints. Um, Frank Prescino gave us a, a copy of his book and a, a T-shirt for... Well, heck, I could have just knocked him down and taken one of his shoes, and then I could give you Tim's shoe. I mean, that's as good as having a Bigfoot footprint, oh, isn't it? Oh, there you go. Okay, we'll take it. He's got gargantuan <laughs> feet. They're huge, Dusty. Oh, no. Don't tell, <laughs> you know don't what tell they say, Eric. Dusty. He might want to make a plaster cast. <laughs> he even has <laughs> dermal ridges, so it'll look you know professional. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah, so people can help you again for helping to restore some of these historical exactly. sites. Exactly, and tickets are only a buck a piece. We'll mail them to you. You can pay via PayPal, send us a check, money order, whatever. Very cool. Well, now talk and to then, me a little bit about that, too, as, as I was asking you before. I mean, do you guys have um, any? Have you ever dealt with elementals or yes. trolls, um, fairies? Well, the whole trolls and fairies and stuff like that, again, I'm not saying that they're not out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've never dealt with them, as far as I know. Um, elementals, in the almost 15 years that I've been doing this, we've worked two cases um, that we believe were elemental in nature. Um, now, one, explain to the listeners, too, Dusty, what is an elemental? What is the difference um, between an elemental, a ghost, a demon, a you know, malevolent spirit, right, a poltergeist? Um, actually, elementals are, are, are relatively close in the way they behave. To demonic activity. Um, they're very negative. Um, they cre- can create hot spots instead of cold spots. Um, they make all kinds of deep guttural noises on EVPs. Um, they're just, they're not nice. Uh, but the difference being that um, demonic in nature activity um, is to basically tear a family apart an elemental um, haunting uh, usually has something to do with the area. And uh, to give a good example, we worked a case in uh, Jacksonville several years ago after um, the hurricanes had come through. 
Guy lived in the house for 20 years, never had a problem. All of a sudden, his neighbor's tree comes down, hits the corner of his roof, and he's having all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So we come in, and we research the house, and sure enough, we find, like, a lot of crazy stuff going on. And he finally tells me that um, this yew tree, which is a very sacred tree to the Native Americans of the area, came down in the storm, and he wound up cutting it up. And I said, hmm, okay, how about we replant a yew tree, dedicate it to this elemental, and see what happens. And sure enough, he went to a a nursery, picked up a a little sapling yew tree, planted it, and of course we stood out there sounding like morons, going, oh, elementals of the earth and the trees and the (laughs) most, you know, we are giving you this gift of this tree to replace the one that the hurricane took you know, going through this whole thing, right. and, you know, and guess what? The activity stopped. Hmm. So, um, you know, that to me said, okay, yeah, we were dealing with an elemental. Very interesting. So elementals, y- y- you find that they can be as nasty as some of the demonic, but it seems more like if you're just encroaching on their territory, right? Exactly. They don't um, go looking for trouble. right? deal with trees, flowers, plants, and, of course, the, the ground. Air elementals, that's self-explanatory. Um, water elementals, again, self-explanatory. And then fire elementals um, are usually around uh, volcanic activity, lava flows, things like that. Um, there's not a lot of research done as far as elementals go. Um, a lot of pagans know and understand what they are. Um, which makes it a little bit easier to, to help deal with them, um, you know, if you're coming at it from that um, spiritual aspect. Right. Um, but, yeah, they are out there. Um, they're few and far between. Um, but, you know, if, if any are doing a case where they're, they're not getting why what's going on is going on and, you know, hmm. they're thinking it's maybe demonic and trying all the, the, the standard ways to, you know, bring that type of haunting to a resolution and it's not working, you may want to look and see if it's possibly an elemental. Now, are there telltale signs? I mean, like with demonics, we get the nasty smell, things wrapping in numbers of three that seem to occur. Is there a way to tell the difference between an elemental and a demon? Yeah, it's, like I said, they've got a lot of similarities to a a demonic haunting. Um, One of the things we've noticed with the couple that we have worked is that they tend to walk very heavily, um, usually across the roof or up in the attic. Um, We don't have a lot of basements here in Florida, Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure about other geographic locations in the the U.S. or even in the world. Um, The the smells are more um, like compost, rotting flesh, um, burnt trees, um, things of a more natural um, source, whereas with demonic hauntings, you're usually dealing with smells of excrement, sulfur, um, things like that, vomit, yay. Um, and then, um, again, the, the, the EVPs that we've caught are very guttural, um, growling-type noises, where with demonic hauntings, um, you usually get voices that sound um, neither male nor female. They're very hermaphroditic, however you say that word. <laughs> is that a word? I, it sounds like a word. good word to me. Okay, if it if isn't, George, it's if George W. Word. can come up with uh, strategery, you can come up with hermaphroditic. I'll, I'll okay, give you that. Okay, <laughs> great. Works for me. So. Um, and then again, um, mostly hot spots, although they can create cold spots, um, especially if it's a uh, water elemental in a northern area, because then you're going to deal with ice and snow. And if it happens to be that, then, you know, you're going to deal with cold spots in, in, as opposed to hot spots. Well, let me ask you this, too. Now, you know, I dealt with a, a, a strange event that happened. Oh, about a year and a half ago, I went with a couple of friends of mine to this forest preserve out in Illinois, 
and it's a well-known spot, and it's supposed to be haunted, and, it, you know, it is an actual Indian burial ground. When you come into it, there's this big rock that's dedicated to the Indian family that is buried there. And we were walking through and talking, and suddenly there was this <clears throat> loud wailing sound. I, I You know, I always try to do it for people, but it'll probably sound even weirder over the phone, but it was just kind of, <laughs> it almost sounded like a siren at first, because it was this high-pitched noise, and it went, and then it it started to get really loud, like a like a tornado siren or air raid siren, and then all of a sudden it flipped into just what sounded like thousands of dogs, thousands. Mm. I mean, just <laughs> and they're charging through the woods at us. Um, wow. <clears throat> my friend goes, "Oh crap, Dave! There's coyotes out here," and I said, "That many?" And he said, "Yeah, and they'll attack." So, being the good group we are, <coughs> excuse me, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold here. Um, we all reach out and grab a stick and go back to back, right? And we're standing there waiting for these things, and it's coming through the woods, man. It's just getting louder and closer and louder, and you can hear trees snapping and branches moving, and and it stops. Huh. Not another noise, and not even like, you know, when dogs go and pack, I mean, you know, they'll shut up, but then you'll hear a couple of the straight, you know, you'll hear the little grumbling right, right. dogs still going. There was nothing. And the sound you know, of the sound of brush and trees stopped. Everything just, boom, just it was gone. Now, would you consider that an elemental? That you know, because that's another thing that elementals will do is um, manipulate sound, manipulate um, natural noises, um, you know, anything like that. I mean, there's so much about this world that we don't understand. I mean, you know. As far as Native American beliefs go, you know, they have all kinds of spirits mm -hmm. that roam the earth for various reasons, um, and most of them are to protect their sacred areas. And, you know, for all you know, this could have been, you know, some sort of sacred ground of theirs where they didn't want you trespassing and their little spirit guardians you know, said, hmm, what's the easiest way to scare them? Ah, we'll bring out the spirits of all the wolves and coyotes and make them be afraid. You know, I mean, just the best guess, but, you know, it's very possible. We don't, that's the, that, this is what I love about this field. There are so many questions and so few answers, and the more answers we think we get, the more questions we wind up having. Yeah, no doubt. Well, let's, we have to take our second break here, Dusty. Hold on. We're going to be right back with more. You're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Once you have seen Dave and Tim in the light, you'll understand why we must return to the darkness on the edge of town. Stay tuned. There is more to come. And welcome back to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, and our guest this evening is lovely Miss Dusty Smith. Dusty, let's talk about your book. We've got about uh, 12 minutes, 15 minutes left here on the show. Let's talk about your newest book and tell us a little bit about it and tell us some about the uh, best ghost stories you've been able to collect out there. Okay. Well, um, most people know my first book, Dread and the Dead Filled the Dunham House, which was the one that was filmed for uh, the episode on the Discovery Channel series, The Haunting, and was nominated for Paranormal Book of the Year for 2007. Very cool. Um, I'm one is Haunted Daytona Beach, a ghostly tour of the world's most famous beach, which the book in, a, in and of itself is kind of unique because, number one, nobody's ever written ghost stories about this area um, in such a way. We actually documented the ghost stories. Um, we didn't just take local folklore and throw them into a book. We went out and researched these stories and the ones that we found to be true hauntings and documented as true, we included in the book, which is kind of cool. Um, I have a couple of favorites in that book. The Pink Lady, I think, is one of my favorites. Um, she had uh, two loves in her life. One, of course, was her husband, and the other was gardening. <coughs> mm -hmm. And um, when she got a little older, she couldn't take, keep up with her gardening chores. Um, and her husband, who was a very jealous man, um, didn't want her to hire any help 
um, with her, you know, to help her with the garden. But, you know, when he finally realized that if he didn't let her hire somebody else, he was going to have to get out there and do the work, right. that's when he agreed. <laughs> and um, It's funny was, how we men figure that out eventually, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's that honey-do list, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, one of the, uh, when she, you know, had this guy working for her, of course, the jealous husband decides that they're having an affair. And, of course, there was nothing going on except the love of gardening, but he confronts them, winds up fire in the gardener, and then murders his wife. And he buried her in the backyard, and several years later, the family that moved in, because it's actually still legal to bury your family on your property in Daytona, um, as long as you have a special permit and blah, 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 you have to have a certain amount of acreage. Um, and this other family moved her body over to Pinewood Cemetery, and it was a family burial. Well, he moves back to the area, finds out that they move her to the cemetery, and when he covered up her grave, he had used pink phlox flowers because pink was her favorite color. And he goes to the cemetery, sees her grave covered in these flowers, has a massive heart attack, and dies on the spot. Well... In the spring, when you go to the cemetery, you can still see an imprint of his body on her grave. Really? So I told the story on my tour one night, and the couple that owned the house happened to come on the tour that night, and they said, oh my gosh, we have some activity at our house. Would you come check it out? And I said, sure, no problem. So we go over, come to find out they've got a very interesting patch of pink flowers in their backyard, that's in the shape of a female body. His daughter also looks very similar to the way that the woman looked when she was in her late 30s, early 40s, and every time she would come down to visit her parents, she'd try to sleep in the the bedroom that would have been the couple's master bedroom, and she'd get woken in the middle of the night, gasping for breath and feeling hands around her throat. And that's the way he killed her, was he choked her to death. Wow. So there's something to be so, said for that, huh? Holy cow. Yeah. <clears throat> Daytona's a pretty charming town when it comes to <laughs> its um, ghostly and deadly history. A lot of rum runners, harlots, mobsters, things like that. This was this was a very interesting town years ago. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize the, the history that's here. They think it's all NASCAR, Bike Week, and Spring Break, and that's <laughs> not the truth, you know. And now the new book, which will be out first week of September, is called um, Haunted the Land and the Ghosts of West Volusia County, which you did very well for pronouncing that. Um, there's also never been a book written about the, the ghost stories over there. Um, towns like the land, Casadega, um, we have a couple of ghost towns here in Florida. Um, so I wrote about St. Francis and, and such. And uh, this book was a lot more fun because even though a lot of the stories are true and we did research them, Dusty? there are... Dusty? Uh-huh? Can you hear that screeching over the phone? No. Wow, Tim is just looking perplexed at me. We don't know. Oh, and it's gone. Well, I apologize to anybody out there that had to deal with that, but that was uh, that was horrible. Ooh. Yes, I'm talking about you. Please stop. Thank you. <laughs> All right, you didn't hear that, huh? Ooh. No, uh uh-uh. uh. Wow, this is horrible, Tim. I don't know what's going on. It's just exploding. Can you hear this? No, I don't hear anything except you guys. Wow. Yeah, I'm, it's like something screaming at us here. Huh. Bizarre. I didn't do it. Yeah, nice. Keep your damn ghosts to yourself, would you? Maybe this one doesn't <laughs> want you to tell the story, Dusty. I don't know. That's uh, horrific. <clears throat> <laughs> All these people that are going to be at work listening to this later on, Tim, with their little headphones on, all of a they're going to hear the ring, Between that and right? my squealing and barking right? at them, oh they're going to... Oh, my gosh, that's too funny. They're going to freak out. Uh, I'm sorry, so go ahead. You were saying... Well, one of my favorites about that area, of course, is, is absolute folklore and legend. Um, comes from the town of Casadega, which is a spiritualist camp, um, and it's the legend of the Devil's Chair. And it's just such a great story I had to include it in the book. 
Um, so there are a couple of folklore stories in that one. But again, most of them are cases that we documented, and a couple of them are very creepy. Um, there were, there's one about an old honey processing plant where the owner of the, the plant um, and his drunk poker buddies killed four, uh, four or five young boys, five young boys, um, and buried them. And now the hotel that's built on top of the area where they buried these kids and unmarked graves is extremely haunted. Um, we actually documented temperatures in the section of the hotel where they found these little boys buried um, over a thousand degrees. Wow. Yeah, so um, it's a good book. I think it's actually the best one I've written so far because I had a lot of fun writing it this time. I wasn't under a lot of pressure to get it done on any, you know, time frame or anything like that. So, um, and they gave me a little more leeway with creativity this time than in the past. Um, so it's a good book. I like it. <laughs> well, good. And how can people get your too. books? Where are they available? Um, actually, uh, the Daytona book and the DeLam book are through the History Press. Um, they can either get them from me um, through the websites or eBay. I sell everything on eBay. Um, if they come on our ghost tour, they can get them there. And, of course, I sell them less expensively than the publishing house does. Um, plus Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, you know, all the online sites. Um, and then the, the Dunham book, again, they can get from me, or that one was done through Publish America. What do you find, with all the years that you've been in investigating, what has been the most, and we like to do this, we always like to leave people with some of the scarier stories. What's one of the scarier things that you've been through yourself personally? That would be looking at my checkbook. <laughs> yeah, you and me both, sister. Gas prices um, and my checkbook every week, that scares yeah, the hell out of me. Or calling my mother. No, just <laughs> um, actually, the, uh, the scariest experience was working the Dunham case. Um, you know, because that we did have demonic activity in the house. Um, we also had an elemental, several residual hauntings. Now, how do you guys deal with a um, with a demonic on your team? What who who do you have that you dispatch to take care of those kind of things? Well, we tried everything. We brought out priests. We tried cleansings. We tried exorcisms. The whole nine yards. And this sucker sucker was dug. You know deeper than a tick on a hound dog i mean <laughs> it, it just it would not leave and you know after months and months and months of trying we finally just you know said look you guys got to leave um because this thing was focused on their their infant daughter um you know but the the thing a couple of things that happened on the case was um i got my hair yanked so hard that I actually herniated two discs in my mm. neck, and then a couple of months later, they threw a set of golf clubs at me, and I broke three ribs. So you're you're really loving your job so far, huh, Dust? Oh yeah, you know. Well, it's like I tell everybody, you know, the first piece of equipment every paranormal investigator should carry with them is a spare change of underwear. <laughs> spare change of underwear, and a, a, I guess your insurance card, too, if they're going to be throwing yeah, stuff at and, you. you know, guys should wear a cup, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, is this dangerous work? No, it really isn't. You know, it, these cases are few and far between. You really don't have cases like this crop up that often. Um, you know, so the likelihood of people getting injured... Um, is more often related to their flight or fright response. Um, you know, there's only one recorded case in U.S. history of a ghost actually causing the death of a human being, and that would be the, the Bell Witch of Adams, Tennessee. And even though it was a well-documented case, there's still a lot of questions surrounding it so that we don't really know, was it a spirit or was it... Um, the, the woman that um, John Bell had so many issues with. Right. And that was just a heart attack from dealing with it, supposedly, correct? Exactly. Right. But now, you know, people always ask the question, Dusty, can a ghost hurt us? What is well, your honest belief? Now, you know, there's also the theories that, well, a ghost can't uh, lift it or move anything over 10 pounds. 
Have well, you heard I that? I know I mean, those golf clubs were pretty yeah. heavy. <laughs> you know, I think it depends on um, the circumstances, the situation. I mean, what kind of what level of haunting you're dealing with. There's a lot of factors involved. I don't think you can say it's one thing or another. The possibility is there. So it's very important that, you know, researchers and investigators um, be aware of their surroundings at all times um, and that and know, you know, the possibility is there. Um, again, like orbs, it's a very small percentage. Right. But, yeah, it does happen. You know, you do this long enough and you expose yourself to these things enough. I mean, basically, I do this seven nights a week. You know, I have the ghost tours seven nights a week. We mm-hmm. work one to three cases a week. Um, plus, I have the cemetery group, so we're running security frequently out there at night, which our cemeteries are also um, pretty haunted. You know, so I expose myself to this a lot more than most people do, even a lot of paranormal investigators and ghost hunters. Well, what do you recommend um, for people that are getting started? We only have about, what, two minutes left here, Tim? Educate yourself. And how do they do that? You know, there's there's a couple of really great courses out there. Um, the the course offered through Troy Taylor's American Ghost Society is an awesome one. Uh, Flamel College is another great one. And I just recently took another one that I think is, is one of the best out there now um, through Paranexus um, because not only does it teach you how to use equipment and fill out log sheets and all of that, It actually gets into, you know, why do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. What is your reasoning for getting into the field? You know, and I'm not against new groups starting up and all of that, but I've seen some of them come out. I had one guy a couple of years ago put on his website a donation button so that he and his his, um, wife could buy a house. You know, that to me is just tacky. Yeah, I agree. And I understand that we have costs and I'm okay with people asking for donations and all, but um, to charge people $1,200 to look at, you know, 10 photographs yeah. or half an hour of <laughs> video footage is a little bit much. Exactly. Well, Dusty, thank you very much for spending time with us here this evening. I hope that you'll come back on the show when your new books are coming out. We'll talk to you some more. Great. Great. Well, time, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, you too, Tim. And now you're going to be out at Mid-South Paranormal Conference? Sure am. All right, great. Well, I'll see you out there, and all you guys check out our website at darknessradio.com. Click on the events page, and you too can join us out at the Mid South Paranormal Conference. See Dusty Smith, myself, Patrick Burns, and a host of other great speakers. We'll be back with more after the top of the hour. Stay with us. You're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town. <laughs> 